one of the important things to understand as you come to practice the Dhamma is that you're not running away from anything. If you want to run away from the human race, you come out here and what have you got? You're sitting here under, under the tree, you're sitting with a member of the human race. You want to run away from your body, you're sitting there with your body. You want to run away from the issues of the mind, you find that when things are quiet, the issues have more space to come and confront you. So once you realize there's no place to run away, what do you do? You have to turn around and learn how to deal with these things. If it's something unskillful in the mind, you have to learn how to reason with it. You can't just push it away and pretend it's not there. You have to enter into a dialogue. As for the body, before you drop attachment to the body, you've got to learn that the body has its good side. Like we're discussing today. When you sit with the body, sit with the breath, and things get out of balance. The properties that can help bring it, bring it back into balance are right there in the body as well. If things feel too heavy, too dense. Okay, that's the earth element. The earth element is balanced out by the, the wind element or the breath element. If things get too hot, you've got the water element to cool things off. If you feel dizzy and lightheaded, well, the earth element can help there. You want to learn how to bring these things into balance, learn how to get in touch with them. You can't run away from them, so learn how to get actually more intimately involved with them, but with the right understanding. That it's only when you sort things out in this way that you can finally let go, not out of aversion, but out of dispassion. You've seen how far these properties can go, and you get on good terms with them before you say goodbye. That way you're letting go is not neurotic, not based on unskillful motivation. It comes from understanding. The body has its good points, but they go only so far, and you found something that goes farther. The same with issues in the mind. Some people come to meditation hoping they can just shut everything down in the mind. They don't have to think, they don't have to deal with anything. Just push things out. Well, the more you push things out, the more they come rebounding back to you. You've got to learn how to sit down and talk things through, enter into a dialogue. For instance, when you're doing metta meditation, goodwill. Try to feel goodwill for yourself, and if you have trouble wishing happiness for yourself, you've got to ask yourself, well, why? It makes no sense not to be able to wish happiness for yourself. What secret issues do you have, or issues that you haven't uncovered? You've got to learn how to take them out. Now, this is where mindfulness and concentration come in to help, because you need a good place to sit down and talk. If the playing field isn't level, if there are lots of places where you can hide, the dialogue doesn't get anywhere. You have to have good neutral ground in which you can stand and talk things over. Because every impulse in the mind is an impulse aimed towards pleasure, aimed towards happiness. The problem is that a lot of our impulses get based on twisted ideas.
out where that happiness could lie. So you've got to learn how to talk with your various impulses. And that means, one, admitting that they're there. It's all too easy when you think thoughts of goodwill for everybody out there. It's like you're spreading marshmallow cream over the whole world. And the people you like and the people you don't like just become buried in the marshmallow cream. And as a result, everybody gets invisible. All you see is the marshmallow cream. But that's not goodwill. That's not honest goodwill. Honest goodwill goes through all the people. Is there anybody out there that you really have trouble feeling goodwill for? And you have to ask yourself, why? What do you gain by having ill will for somebody? Why would you want that person to suffer? And part of your mind will say, well, they did this and they did that, either to me or people I like, or people I pity. You say, okay, all right, that's not right what they did, but if they start suffering, is that going to make everything better? Or are they just going to want more revenge? When you wish goodwill, you actually remember you're wishing true happiness for that person. Not simply that the person has lots of wealth and lots of influence and lots of whatever else he or she wants. You're hoping that that person will understand. Oh, true happiness comes this way. And that person will start acting on that. If everybody were acting on a correct understanding of where happiness comes from, the whole world would be a much better place. So it really is in your best interest to wish happiness, true happiness, for everyone. Or if you try to sit and concentrate and you find that part of the mind resists, either it starts putting you to sleep, getting you bored, you've got to ask, okay, what would you rather be doing? And if the mind says, well, I'd rather be thinking. I'm used to, much more used to thinking. Okay, we'll give it something to think about, but something that's useful. You can go through the parts of the body. Where are your bones right now, the different bones in the skeleton? Say when you think of the bones in your fingers, well, actually, pay attention to how your fingers feel. Is there a tension in your fingers around the bones? If there is, we'll let it relax. And then move up your hands, past the wrists, past the forearms, past the elbows the upper arms, the shoulder, on either side, and then start with your toes. In other words, be aware of your body, but at the same time, give yourself something to think about, something to do. Or you could vary things by looking at how the breath feels in the different parts of the body. Try to get as precise as you can each little part of the body, starting again with the tips of the fingers and on up. You breathe in, how does it feel in that part of the body? Do you, or do you carry tension around in that part of the body? Can you relax it? In other words, if the mind gets bored, give it work to do. Dharma work. Mindfulness work. In other words, learn how to negotiate inside. So if you find that there's a resistance, a reasonable resistance to something you're trying to do, well, Learn how to negotiate it so the different parts of the mind can feel m more at home with one another. And they can actually have real conversations, open and honest conversations, frank conversations. And this way the mind becomes less and less of a mystery to you, and you can become more and more confident in your motivation, not only as you sit here with your eyes closed, but when you're dealing with other people. It's normal that we want everything to be cleared up as quickly as possible. We all would like to have that magic pill or that sudden insight that clears up all your problems. But it turns out it doesn't work out that way. What does work out is you deal things, deal with things issue by issue, problem by problem as these things come up. And the more skillfully you learn how to deal with these little things, and the bigger issues start getting resolved or at least they get easier to handle. 
because you're developing sensitivity. You're developing a sense of trust in the mind and openness in the mind. And these things don't happen all at once. They develop gradually. As you work on this gradual process, things get clearer inside, because there are fewer walls set up. You don't pretend that the unskillful thoughts are there. You admit that they're there, and then you learn how to deal with them. And this way, when the mind becomes clear, you begin to see how to handle things, how to handle difficulties inside. Once you learn how to handle difficulties inside, it's easier to do it outside as well. In fact, the two processes go together. Often people who have a lot of problems holding rational conversations inside their own mind come from homes where there were problems in holding rational conversations between people. If that's the case, well, try to think of someone you know who does handle problems well and how that person can sort of come into your mind, sort things out, talk rationally with the, the irrational elements. And John Fuhr occasionally would have people come with problems of spirit possession. Now we in the West would say, well, is it really spirit possession or is it schizophrenia? But the problems were real, and there really was another personality in that person, whether it was that person's second personality or something from outside. Either way, he would just spread thoughts of goodwill to both sides and then start a dialogue. Why are you here? What do you want? And he was able to negotiate a settlement. So whether that was actually an exorcism or simply just straightening something, something out inside, regardless of how you interpret it, it worked. This one woman came one time and she had this problem that she would yell and scream at people who were her close friends. So as a result, she couldn't live with anybody. She had to live alone. So one day she came to see a John Fu and all of a sudden the yelling and screaming side started coming out. So John Fu asked her, well, okay, what do you want? And this other side started saying that in a previous lifetime this woman did this or did, or did that to me. And he asked her, well, if you, if you interfere in this woman's life, you know, she's going to come and interfere in your life next time around. Do you want that? Well, no. How about letting her live a normal life, make merit, dedicate the merit to you? Does that make sense? Yes. So that was the resolution. So if parts of your mind are pulling in opposite directions, try to think of someone like that coming in and learning how to sort things out, letting both sides speak, and working out your differences. Because it is possible to work out differences based on the assumption that everything going on in the mind wants true happiness. It's just lots of very misinformed impulses there in the mind, who don't know where true, true happiness lies, what it would be, how you would get there. But if you go in with the confidence that things can be sorted out, then when the time comes to let go, you're, you're letting go not out of anger or fear, you're letting go out of understanding. After all, that's the Buddha's analysis. It's through discernment that you let go. It doesn't have to be the sort of discernment you read about in books. It re simply means the discernment of how to handle things in the mind. How to test the limits of physical properties in your body, the thoughts in your mind. See how far they go in leading to true happiness. And then letting them go when you find something better. So when you say goodbye, it's not saying goodbye 
slamming the door, running away. And some more, well, thanks for getting me here. But the time has come to move on. So it's a gradual process, this path we're following. Insights here and there. Greater skill developing incrementally here and there. But it's the only process that works.